Thank you. Thank you for inviting me this evening. I'm quite excited to be here. And um, it was a lovely drive over from Ramsbottom to uh, Blackburn today, apart from the rain. Uh, but it got me out of trick and treating with the kids. So <laughs> thank you for having me. So um, your theme today is communities and education. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we at the Soil Association do around educating um, community groups and working with community groups around food and food systems. Now, one of the things that, you know, food systems is, is massively complex. If you eat, you have an opinion about it. If you have celebrations, it always involves food. And food happens to be the most emotive subject that anyone can bring to a table. Pardon the pun. So, well, we always start with soil, and I've bought my uh, daughter's little mini greenhouse that she made over half term because I just wanted to say that everything that we do in life connects with nature. Um, and at the Soil Association, what we want to do is connect people, planet, and our health together. So we start with our soil. That's where our little infographic begins with, up there, and I'll work our way clockwise round to share with you um, the story of how we work at the Soil Association. So why soil? About 75 years ago, Lady Eve Balfour sat down with a group of farmers, doctors, scientists, and they all wanted to make the case that climate, nature and health are all connected. One won't work without the other, and we're all affected by it. So as you will have heard through various other presentations, is that food and the food system is probably one of the, well, 25% of the contributions to cl climate change. But not only does it contribute to climate change, it is actually most affected by cl climate change as well. So we will see in the future that our food and our sustainable diets need to change in order to actually make sure there's enough food to go around for the future as well. So not only is it a contributor, it's, it's equally affected by it as well, and as we've seen through droughts and flooding throughout the world. The reason why we always start with soil is the soil is part of who we are. It not only locks carbon, but actually soil is living. So there is many organisms in a teaspoon of soil as there are people on the planet. So if you can imagine that, literally the ground beneath your feet is alive, it's living. We need to look after it, we need to nurture it. What we put in it, what we put on it, what we do with it, it all matters day in, day out. So you will have heard about biodiversity, the lovely um, things that David Attenborough does, and frozen planet, and wildlife species becoming extinct. So actually our farming systems really look after the biodiversity and after plants that we grow and the food that we eat all contribute to looking after plants and animals. There's two minutes left. Two minutes left? Okay. Um, what I wanted to say then mainly is, firstly, our organic principles. Now, our organic principles are built on respect. Respect for people, planet, the animals we eat, how we farm our animals, but most importantly, what we choose to eat and we must see ourselves as citizens of a food system rather than the end consumer. So we must be more knowledgeable about how our food is produced, how our food comes to market, and how our food actually is made, cooked, and bought to us on a daily basis. If we don't start paying attention to how our food arrives on our plate, that's gonna affect not only our own health, but actually the health of the planet as well. What we'd like to see is our farmers more involved in conversations like this about climate change. Do we want to listen to our farmers more? Who owns the land? Who farms our land? Who looks after the animals that we eat? Who looks after the animals that look after the rest of the other wildlife <coughs> that are um, growing and taking place all around the country? But also, what we want to do is work with our schools, our hospitals, our nurseries, on the food that comes to us from public service. So we should at least be looking after our children and old people well by giving them the right nutritious food to grow old, to be healthy, to thrive, to learn, 
a well-fed child is a well-learned child and ready to learn. And you will have heard a lot about school meals in the um, news lately. But not only that, but if we have a healthy diet, not only do we learn better, but we grow better and with less impact on our NHS as well. Okay. And the great thing about food is it's the great connection. So when we eat food, it's always a great connector in not only celebrations, but in life and there's sharing cups of teas. So food in terms of isolation and um, supporting community level work is a great connector as well. Thank you. Sorry, I'll have to that's alright. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I feel like it's a real pleasure to follow on from you, Chandra. So, about five years ago, before I was even asked to um, think about becoming a counsellor, I have a friend called Tracy Padia who set up a Facebook page called Keep Blackburn Tidy. She doesn't live too far from me. Are you in or you're out, Jack? Because come on, you and Bob are forever going clearing stuff out, the rivers and all the rest of it. We've got to get something done because our back alleys were full of overflowing bins and generally people were in a bit of a muddle. So my nurse background, I also have skills of the transformation work and Tracy is a teacher with a psychology degree. So straight off, we weren't too average bods, I suppose, about little, but, and we gelled quite quickly. So my talk is about how do you then go around impacting people to join your tribe and get stuff done. And so the, you, know, you all saw the sign at the top of the stairs as you're coming up from Arthur Ashe quote, quote, you do what you can with what you've got now. So even though Tracy and I probably believe a lot of the stuff that Chandra has put up with, we knew we'd have to go out there and meet folk with where they were at in our community not necessarily where we'd want them to be. So she set up the Facebook page and we started getting likes and stuff. And pretty quickly we realized that we had to follow some sort of method. She was a teacher, you know, I was a nurse because some of the language being used and things that were being thrown at us were a bit challenging. So we quickly formed a behind the scenes messenger group to go and do you really think that that should have been said? Is that part of our standards and what we, quickly realised we were setting up our own governance framework, setting our own rules of what could be said and couldn't be said. And we realised straight off that we developed quite quickly within that first month that we accepted that there were residents who had, we nicknamed them misunderstandings. They didn't understand about their bin, what to put in their bin and all the rest of it. Um, and we wouldn't name or shame anybody. And I think that very much comes from you know, Tracy's teacher background and my nursing, you never blame somebody. You ask why five times to go and meet with them with where they're at. So where has that taken us now? Um, if we roll forward five years, we've had our peaks and troughs of clearing up. Um, we've got to know Stuart and his team. He'll talk about all that bit, but we're still very much that grassroots. And we believe in having conversations with people. So we go out on our own. We will celebrate what we've done. That's an important thing to have a target and count. So, you know, just before Strictly on a private Saturday evening, you'll get the total of bags that have been collected up this week. It's important to have something that you're aiming for. And we encouraged flirting and chit-chatting and polite chit-chat about rubbish. And it's developed into um, poking drains. So we've had conversations about why you need to poke a drain, because you know, the sea starts two, here. Two two <laughs> um, we have a phrase called sprotting, hashtag sprot. What did you sprot today? Well, it's some person's rubbish is another person's treasure. It's something that you found. And instead of chucking it in the bin, you carry on reusing it. So we have lots of conversations about upcycling, recycling, repurposing and just generally doing the right thing with what you've got with where you're at. We try and expand the conversation into encouraging folk not to rip down their privet hedges. I think between us, we probably have quite an expertise in the climate emergency conversations that need to be had, but we've very much took the stance that we wouldn't pre-chat people. So we wait for a topic to come up and then we'll go in all guns and try and provide the right links 
and information that's there. Um, I liked, I went for a trip to Liverpool a couple of weeks ago and I came home and thought, yes, it's important to measure what you've achieved. Around where I live is definitely tidier than where I stayed in Liverpool. And whereas five years ago, I could have collected about 10 bags of rubbish from the end of our street to the traffic lights down the end, you have to have to go for a real effort to collect one. Um, so that's what one of that is about, that persistent underneath the ground, people change stuff. Thank you. I think the four minutes starts now, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And you've all got red cards, I understand it, so, <laughs> I, so I hope I don't get any red cards. I'll try and avoid the jargon. Um, thank you for that introduction. And uh, yeah, I, I know you're going to say, oh, you don't look old enough to have worked in the industry for 30 years, surely. But, um, I heard quite a few people saying never when she said 30 years. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you about rubbish and, and recycling and how we as a council communicate with our residents or try to uh, communicate with our residents about the key issues that we face uh, as a borough and as councils and, and as residents. And as Jackie's alluded to, we do try and work as closely as we can with community enterprises. Um, so there are a couple of things that I just need to spell out, to put things in context really, and forgive me if I go over information that you already know. Um, the first thing is that as a local authority we have a statutory role to collect your rubbish and arrange for its disposal. And so that's the reason that we get involved in rubbish. And that dates from the late 1890s when councils were tasked with taking away people's rubbish. Um, but until about the year 2000, there really wasn't that much that councils need to do in terms of communicating with residents about, about their rubbish because, um, well, first of all, people didn't have a, what we call a curbside recycling system. You just had the one bin or the one bag. You put all of your rubbish in that bag. It went into the back of the, the truck like this, and that was pretty much the end of it. It went to a landfill site for us at Winnie Hill in Accrington, for people who know it, and that was all all that, that, that took place really. The only education we really needed to do was to tell you when to put your bin out and please don't drop litter. And that was pretty much it. But come the start of the 2000s, the government started setting targets for recycling and encouraging councils to set up recycling schemes. And, and all of you, I'm sure, are now familiar with the green box that you might have had at one time and now your, your grey bin and your blue bin and perhaps your brown bin. Nod at me if I'm all <laughs> making sense to you. Um, and as a result of that, we started to need to communicate with people about how they use their bin, bins correctly. Um, but it's important for me to say that at that time, and even now really, that isn't within the context of climate change. The government's messages were all about reducing rubbish that was going to landfill to save resources. It wasn't about climate change. It wasn't about acid rain or saving the rainforest, it was all about saving money and also about prevent, preventing re valuable resources from aluminium cans to, to food perhaps going into a hole in the ground. And that continues to this day. Our, our messages are still, because the government sets us targets based upon waste tonnage, not on climate change emissions, uh, that, that's, that continues to be the focus of our communications, although I'm sure that will change in time. I'm sure the government will start giving us targets around climate change emissions, and my colleague Gwen, who sat at the back, who I'm sure you all know, um, will probably tell me more about that. Um, in terms of... If you can just push it down that slide. Okay. In terms of um, our communications, who are the key audiences that we try to communicate? And what are the key topics that we try to communicate with them on as we stand now? Um, so the first thing just is just two minutes. Two minutes. The first is good management, good waste management generally, i.e., put things in the right bins, please, and don't drop litter, which is the second one. And then the third one, which is one that we've really taken on board this year, and hopefully you'll, some of you will be aware of it, is all about food waste and the amount of food that we throw away as a society, particularly as householders, the amount of money that we can save, and also the amount of environmental damage that that does when we throw, when we throw edible food particularly in our bins. Although I won't bore you with some of the statistics, I don't think we've got time, but perhaps when we break into the group, we'll have the opportunity to look at that. 
In terms of our key audiences, it won't surprise you to know that all of the residents of Blackburn with Darwin are who we're aiming to get at. Uh, but particularly we're looking to get to speak to children because they are the, the parents of the future, they're the next generation. We need to get them involved in good habits as early as we possibly can. And I'll just finish by saying that some of the um, techniques that we use to do that um, started out um, from re some research that the government did back in about 2010. And they were looking to try and grasp this climate change uh, nettle. And they tasked one particular institute with going away and looking at all of the um, governments across the world and what were the best practice examples they could find of where governments had tried to educate their citizens to change their behaviour. Not necessarily about climate change, it might be by carrying a donor card, for example. Uh, all sorts of useful social issues. And they came up with this, this um, moniker called nudge theory and behaviour change techniques. And it means that essentially what we're trying to do now in the council is try and try and find out what it is that is going to change that person's <coughs> behaviour. So for example, if I give you a message about f food waste, you may say, oh, well, I don't know Stuart, I don't know him from Adam, I'm not going to listen to him. But if I'm Stuart winner of Strictly Come Dancing from 2019, and you really like me because I'm a terrific dancer, then you might turn around and say, actually, I might listen to Stuart. Because I, I believe what he says, I, 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 I like him as an individual. Or um, maybe it's a message that you would hear from your bin crew, and you like your bin crew, you get on well with them, you see him every week, you have a bit of chit chat. <laughs> so, so do you see what I'm saying? We, we need to try and find out who the best messenger is to get our message across along with what is the message that we need to convey that you will actually engage with. Is it about saving you money? Is it about protecting the environment? Is it about creating local jobs? And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
and the college is really identified with that. So one of the big things we're looking at is how we can actually upskill that, both from electric cars, heat pumps, solar panels, battery storage. There are four key areas and what we're looking at at the moment. Um, so over the next two years as well, it will become a part of our main syllabus as well. So students will be able to come and study sustainability. Now, someone who is currently looking for a sustainability officer, it's really hard to find someone with a skill set or a passion that wants to do it, who's not working for a large company based in London, wanting really large money. So we really need to look at that young generation who have a passion to actually make a difference for the future. And the college is really, really biting into that, both from uh, apprenticeships, work placements, as well as core education as well. Um, it's my, it's my I'll, fin I'll finish it there. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much.